There she is. Good. Well, John chapter 14, verses 24, 15 to 26. And this scripture is one of um, perhaps three New Testament scriptures, essential scriptures that explain to the church, uh, to the new churches and Jesus' body of people about the nature of the Holy Spirit. The, the second of these um, is in John chapter 16, later in Jesus' discussion with the disciples, around verses 7 to 15, where Jesus spends some time talking about the work of the Holy Spirit. And the third essential, say essential, um, passage is Romans 8, 1 to 17, where Paul, um, the last apostle, teaches on the power of the Holy Spirit. So here we are in this first of those three in John 14, 15 to 26, where Jesus um, reveals in a clear, straightforward way the identity of the Holy Spirit, of who God will be to all Christians as Jesus was to those disciples. So God had been promised, God had said, one will come, he will be Emmanuel, he will be the Saviour. But Jesus tells the disciples only, only moments ago, it's better that I go away. It's better that I go to God and send another. And so to the church, the Holy Spirit represents God as Jesus represented God to the disciples. So in this sense, when we're in this scripture, um, one of the things that's really important, I was thinking about, there are so many analogies. If we had the time, all of us could express to the, other, to the group one thing we did this week. One thing, it might be Linda yesterday, she had a birthday. She might have told us how it felt when she blew out the candles. Did you blow out candles? You didn't blow out candles. It felt terrible not to blow out candles, Ken. Um, Linda, no candles. I'm going to give you a candle later. Um, some of you, you've been to other places, you've done other things. Now we can listen to one another, talk about a moment in our lives, but it's not the same as experiencing it. And I think one of the, the truths here is when we speak of the Holy Spirit, we speak in whispers, we speak in hopes, we speak in thoughts and images and pictures of the Creator Spirit, of the Spirit of God who hovered over the waters as life was spoken into in all fullness. And we are very limited. But what we see here is Jesus who isn't limited, who is one in God with the Spirit. He is able to give us a greater understanding. But this understanding is not something that we take and we go, I have this head knowledge. To understand the Spirit is something that must be brought into our hearts because what Jesus is teaching us about part of who God is, is essential for us as Christians. Uh, you know there are many images of the Holy Spirit and God and Jesus, so Father and Jesus as God. You know, some people have used the one of water. You know, water can be ice. It can be water, it can be vapour, and they're three different expressions of the same substance. And Jesus can speak with a clarity about the Spirit that we can never have. And sometimes preachers perhaps say more about the Holy Spirit than, than they can truly evidence. But what he gives us here is so helpful because this is he who danced with the Spirit when life was created. He who is able to help us to understand the God who will be with us through the person of the Spirit. And what happens in this scripture, I guess, is Jesus shows us six expressions of the identity of the Holy Spirit. The reality of these expressions is something we need to reflect on. We need to think about um, how he's described the Spirit, 
what that means to us and how we connect into that into our lives. Because when he says he's going and the Spirit's coming that's better for us, what we see is, is the Spirit is given to you and I um, that we might relate to God in a growing way, in a full way. Um, so anyway, we're going to look at these through this passage. Um, the first of them is, um, uh, excuse me a second, boys, boys, I'm really sorry, I love you deeply, but you cannot be running around at the back, I'm sorry. Uh, it's just too loud, I'm very sorry. Um, you can do some drawing, but you can't be running around, because otherwise the grown-ups here are going to not hear some of what I'm saying, so my apologies. Um, look, uh, first one of these expressions, it's in relation to Jesus himself, it's in verses 15 and 16, and what we see here is Jesus say, if you're going to receive the Spirit, you first need to have received me. He says to the disciples, like, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. And if you love me, you keep my commands. I'll ask the Father, and the Father will give you another helper who will be with you forever. Now it's obvious to say um, that we should love Jesus. But Jesus is reminding us that true love for him isn't just an expression of words, but it's a, a reality of our person. True love for me, for Jesus, means we seek to keep his commands. We seek to honour what he has called us to. And we, we do so knowing we're not perfect. We're not perfect. Actually, loving Jesus calls us to be honest. It calls us to say we fall short often. But even in falling short, we diligently seek Jesus. We diligently seek to see his face and to please him. To please him. See, loving Jesus is a spiritual commitment for us as Christians. It's not um, centered on emotions or feelings. It's not centered on knowledge in our head, not mental assent or simply logic. But loving Jesus is a matter of heart and spirit that sees what is said to us about him. I remember the moment when I've been in church for a long time, but I remember listening to Billy Graham talk about Jesus on the cross, and there was that switch where my brain went, this is true. And I didn't know how I, how I connected to that, but God had spoken, and it was clear, and inside I knew it was true. So loving Jesus is about our inmost being, recognising that it desires and wills to trust Jesus and to keep him first. And so the Holy Spirit then, Jesus says, is given by the Father to all who genuinely love Jesus. And I think loving Jesus, as we know, it's the foundation, isn't it? The foundation for getting God's help is counsellor, is comforter, the presence of God through the Holy Spirit that stays with us, as Jesus says, forever. Second expression that Jesus goes on to is to talk of the Holy Spirit as truth. He says that the Spirit is full of truth. The world can't receive the Spirit of God. It's unable because they haven't let me in, Jesus is saying. So they're not going to receive the Spirit of truth because they haven't received me. See, when people let Jesus in, our eyes are opened to the spiritual world as it truly is. We recognise that we've fallen short. We recognise that God was right in what he said to us and we recognise that we cannot, but Jesus can. So when we let Jesus in, we are, are beginning to see the world as it truly is. Before him, we knew that there was a drag, there was a struggle, there was a gravity of a spiritual world but we didn't know what that world was. Now, most people here have watched Blue Peter at some point in their lives. It may have been when it was black and white, um, or it may have been more real. And um, we know um, a show that's always come with us. When I was a kid, one of the presenters 
on Blue Peter was a lady called Yvette Fielding. And she was good at making cakes and all of these things and going in the garden and planting flowers. But after that, she's got involved in a show, which is a supernatural show, where she goes around buildings poking ghosts. And she acts like she understands the spiritual world. She says, I think there's a very scary presence in here. And then she goes in there and she starts poking this very scary presence as if she's a master of the spiritual world, and she's not. See, people fiddle with the spiritual world. They look at um, things like mediums. They look at horoscopes. They'll go and they'll try and find out and ask about things because they know there's something spiritual out there, but they don't understand what it truly is. But what Jesus says is, look, there is a spiritual world. If you receive me, the Spirit will come to you. And the Spirit will show you the world as it really is. You will understand by presence and experience the reality of the world around us. The way people's hearts are in battle with God when they don't know him. The way some structures in our world are spiritually oppressing people. You'll see that because the Spirit of God will testify into you. So the spirit of truth comes from God to help us understand the way the world is. And you know what? Even to help us to navigate what we should invest in in our world. And I do mean that. I mean, um, you and I, as consumers on this planet, are always being encouraged to invest in companies, to invest in things. And sometimes we need to approach that with a level of discernment. You know, back in the 90s and 80s when people started talking about a thing like fair trade, I remember um, a few Christians said to me, this is just very fashionable, isn't it? And I'm like, I don't know anything about it as a young person. But then understanding that the point was that somebody who worked in Benin who made chocolate um, beans for a living, got paid fairly and wasn't enslaved labour. Actually, that's not fashionable. That is a truth of standard of life that everybody should have. People shouldn't have their land stolen by Nescafe or other corporations like Amazon. They should be able to have a simple, basic daily bread. And actually, God has made the world capable many times over of producing that. So there is a necessary reality in us as Christians where we should be seeking to perceive about some of the consumer patterns that we have as, as Christians. And so the Spirit of God, I think, is part of us beginning to turn around and say, I see these people asking me to do this. God, is this what you want for me? Is this good for you, for your world? But the spirit of truth doesn't just show us the reality of the world. The spirit of truth, Jesus confirms to us, also shows us the truth of the words of Scripture. It testifies to us that what God has done and said is right. Now look, in Ezekiel 36, in verse 27, there was a prophecy that said, I will put my spirit in you. The Spirit will cause you to walk in my statutes and carefully follow me. And in Romans 8, 16, in that third passage where Paul writes, Paul says, the Spirit of God speaks to us to confirm that we are children of God. And in 1 Corinthians 2, 12, Paul also writes, we have received the very Spirit of God so that we might freely understand all of the things given to us by God. And then one of the great 316 passages in Scripture, it's not just John 316, um, in 1 Corinthians 316, Paul says, Remember, you're God's temple or his Holy Spirit. It lives in you. So that's the first two expressions, the spirit of truth 
showing us the world and confirming and revealing to us the word of God. And the third expression is that of um, the Holy Spirit being Jesus personified, personal presence to us. In verses 18 to 20 of this passage, I'm going to come to you, Jesus reminds us, you won't be slaves, and by my Spirit, you won't be orphaned anymore. See, when we receive the Spirit of God, we receive God's very presence. In verse 19, um, the first part of verse 19, you can just look at that. So when we have the Spirit, the Spirit is to help us see Jesus better, to understand him as the one enthroned by God on high. That um, the Holy Spirit helps us to know him, to recognize that Jesus is really, really walking with us. And you know, sometimes you're going through a dark moment. Isn't that when you want to feel God by your side? The Spirit is there to help us understand that Jesus is really with us. And the Spirit is that but more in the second half of 19. Um, the Spirit is living as a God's eternal presence. And that Spirit, Christ's Spirit, places in us life that is full, that is abundant, and it's eternal. And in verse 20, this creates what Jesus um, describes as a union between God and us. Jesus is like, I'm God, God's in me, you're in me, God and us are in union together. It's what Paul says later in Ephesians 3, verse 17. Christ dwells in your hearts through faith. And there you are rooted and grounded in love. God in us, the Spirit, the loving presence, deep with us. The fourth expression is that the Spirit continues to reveal Jesus to us. And this is a, a reminder of the reality that we are pupils, that he's the rabbi, he's the teacher, that he comes and we must continue to learn, must continue to seek that the Holy Spirit will reveal Jesus to us. See, often we do have deep struggles in our lives and if we're switched on, we'll take our deep struggles to God. We'll turn to God and we'll, um, we'll pray to Jesus and ask that Jesus will come and minister to us love, peace and presence. And we're all inviting to come. We're inviting the Spirit. We won't read Psalm 119 now because it's um, 150 verses of it. But in um, verse 11, of Psalm 119, uh, we're reminded that we must have the commands of God, the Word of God, grounded in our hearts, that it must be grounded there, that it must be known and our own. That means we must live it out. It's like in Psalm 1. Psalm 1 describes a tree which prospers because it's put deep roots into living water, deep roots that feed it and nurture it and stop it from withering. And so, in our walk, especially in our struggles, we need to keep seeking Jesus, keep seeking to follow his commands, be like a good water, a good river that's seeking to get to the sea so that we can take from Jesus the living water that will um, take us through the dark times, take us through the trials. Jesus wants to abandon us, the scriptures teach us, but we, in order to have Jesus abandon us, must delight ourselves in Jesus. We know what it's like to delight ourselves in trinkets and toys, you know, you get a new car or a new telly or um, a new bag or a new phone and you're all like, 
proper evangelical telling everybody how awesome it is. But we must abandon Jesus and delight ourselves in Jesus. And we do that. We do that through seeking closer walk with Jesus through that Holy Spirit. And so the fifth expression, the fifth expression in 23 and 24, God's Spirit is with you. So remember then, God abides in you. And that means that the Father and Jesus are present in us because of the Spirit, as if they were really with us. See, the, the Trinity God, the God three in one, has come to you as a Christian, if you, if you are a Christian. And as Jesus says here, he's made his home in you. He's made his home in you. You're his dear child. And John, Jesus comes back to more of this little bit as we get to John 17. But the final thing of these six expressions of the identity of the Spirit is Jesus is saying, as I'm going, as you've received me, as you've trusted me, now let the Holy Spirit be your teacher. Just as Jesus was rabbi, and many who saw him said, Rabbi, and his teacher, his disciples said to him, You're Rabbi, you're our teacher. Take the Holy Spirit, uh, brothers and sisters, as your good teacher, as your teacher of all that Jesus has said and done. And I think perhaps to do this, sometimes we may need fresh eyes, because I'd say every Christian I have ever met will talk about Jesus a lot, and rightly so. But do we recognize that the Spirit of God is our teacher? Do we recognize that if we want to understand more of the way of the Word, we want to understand more of the reality of the world, we need to seek the Spirit? In verses 25 and verse 26, Jesus focuses on the truth that the Spirit is promised to us and we must, must remember and cling to the Spirit of God. Do you know, I was trying to think of an image for this and we don't get kangaroos here, but you know when the baby's there in the mum's pouch, it's all nestled in and she feeds and she nourishes and she gives it life. I think that is the clinging that Jesus is talking about here. That we would cling to the Holy Spirit, we would nestle in and we would be fed and taught and grown the way that baby kangaroo is, is provided for by its mum. And, and I know that's an alien image to lots of us, especially perhaps men who go, I'm too big to go in the pouch. I mean, I can understand that. We are too big to go in the pouch. But you've got to cling to the Spirit. Be students of the Holy Spirit, the one who can show us all things, give us the words of life, teach us how to please God. Let us do, as Jesus said, greater things than he did. See, the Spirit of God expresses life before God to us but we have to engage. All of the theory, all of the practices, the principles, the conduct, the morality of the behaviour of a Christian comes through seeking God through his spirit. In Luke 12.12, 12, the disciples say to Jesus, teach us what to say. That's what we must say to the spirit. Teach us what to say. In John 16, we're told that the Spirit will be the one who speaks God's authority to us and speaks it through us and will tell us things to come, will speak to us hidden truths, things of present and of future. You know what? That's one of the reasons why Paul says to the church, 
you must greatly desire prophecy. Is it my gain? Is the gain too high? Okay. Paul says to the church when he's speaking of spiritual gifts, you should greatly desire prophecy. And not because it makes you smart or cool, but because if you're with someone and they don't know the Lord, and the Holy Spirit speaks into their life to you. That is one of those moments that can change people. Now, it doesn't mean you go up to somebody, imagine I didn't really know James, and, and I just guess and I go, James, God said, He can heal you of not liking apples. And James is like, I love apples. It means you just take the time in your conversations with people to actually say, Holy Spirit, has God got anything to say to this person? You know, you are being given as Christians the words of life. That's the truth. I, I've only had a couple of times somebody speak about my life when they did not know what, what they were saying, but God did. And it was powerful. I had a Swedish um, guy that I worked with when I was in a birthday party and we had a prayer time at the end of it. And God gave him words of prophecy and it was real. God gave him information about my life and I sat there and, and um, cried. It made a difference. And so that does not happen if you're in conversations with people and all you're full of is yourself. Do you know what I mean? It may be that there isn't anything that God has to say, but you could be there with someone and their heart is breaking about something. And you say, God, can I show them your love? Because it isn't about you, it's about the overwhelming love of God that wants to break over them and heal them and grab them like that lost son is grabbed by his dad and brought into God's embrace. That's why the Spirit has got to be our teacher. So that we make more time to let the Spirit speak. To help more people find just how massive Jesus is. Let's pray together. Dear Lord Jesus, you are overwhelmingly amazing to us. Help us, Lord, if we know the Holy Spirit just to touch, just to take small steps every day to seek the Spirit of God. Help us, Lord, if we're warming and welcoming and leaving us an empty chair in the room with us every day for the Spirit. Help us to listen, because, Lord, only you've got the words of life. And the people around us, people that we pray for and that we love, yes, we can simply say That's a word, this is the Scripture, but Lord, maybe you've got more to say to us through your spirit. Help us to learn to listen and to speak your words of life to our world. Amen. 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 We're going to sing again for our closing prayer. And, uh, We're going to sing uh, Tell Up My Soul. Sorry, Neil. Do you want your tea and coffee now? Um, we're going to sing Tell 